Welcome to The More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. I'm Rebecca Kushmeider, wishing you a happy Easter to those who observe on this lovely uh, final Sunday in May. And I am pleased to be joined on the mic by Kevin Kelton. And I'm proud to announce that I will be selling Torres with (laughs) (laughs) $59.95. So it's four cents less than Trump's Bible which I think makes it a steal. Yeah, especially since the Torah is longer than the Bible. And DJ McGuire. Good evening. This is DJ McGuire from Hampton Roads, Virginia, wishing everybody a happy Trans Visibility Day, and especially congratulations to the Duke Blue. Oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and Greg Matuzak. Okay, seeing as I actually did buy the Trump Bible, because I figure I have to, I'm going to talk about it as much as I can and go read passages as because I, I need to get my $60 worth out of it as often. So do not be surprised if it comes up repeatedly today, because I have to get my money's worth. Otherwise, it's also, if I use it for work here, it's a tax write-off, which is how I think Trump and God wanted the Bible to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to I would like to build on what DJ said about Trans Visibility Day. It is observed on March 31st, has been every year since 2009. But I would like to propose a, a second holiday called Trans Invisibility Day, where all <laughs> trans people are granted the power of invisibility and they can break into people's houses and steal their stuff. <laughs> anyone anyone down for that? Do we really want Caitlyn Jenner to be able to help Donald Trump even the fundraising battle? Do we even want Caitlyn Jenner? Do we even want Caitlyn Jenner to help Donald Trump redecorate? I mean, you know what? It couldn't be worse than the ballrooms I've seen at Mar-a-Lago oh. and Bedminster. How how do you improve on gold toilets? I mean, and and red and red solid steel Christmas trees. I mean, honestly, I think he's got it. I think he's Mel- Melania's perfected it. You know? Yes, <laughs> ten out of she, ten. She just squints, and suddenly it all comes together. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of uh, evening the fundraising battle, Joe Biden is uh, raking it in. He had an event this weekend with Obama and Clinton and raised about twenty five million dollars on that single event. I believe Stephen Colbert was hosting it. So, you know, it's good. And uh, Trump uh, didn't do that at all. He uh, he is way behind on fundraising. The RNC is behind on fundraising. And I believe, if I remember the graphic correctly, Nikki Haley has more cash on hand than the RNC at the moment. <laughs> and uh, Greg, how do, you, how do you think Trump comes back from that uh, once he sells out all the Bibles? Well, first of all, uh, I, I don't mean to correct you, uh, but it's actually $26 million they oh. made. Okay. So let's 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 be exact. Uh, I threw it an extra million. I was so impressed. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, "That's Stephen Colbert. He knows how this thing ends." <laughs> he dance. sure is funny. He is. Uh, he he's a laugh right. He was he was better than when he did the uh, Bush correspondence dinner. But the other thing is, they've already announced that this money has been earmarked, and it's already and commercials have already been made to try to persuade. Nikki Haley voters to Biden. DJ, do you have anything to build on that? You know, you you were part of the Republican machinery at one point. Um, you know, do you think Laura Trump is going to to be the the cash cow that they hope she'll be? Not to call her a cow, but you know what no. I'm saying. <laughs> I'm just a laugh track tonight. <laughs> Rebecca, I believe the question you're asking is, will she be able to tip the cash cow for the Republicans? And the answer is I'm not sure, and here's why. For one thing, the RNC is now using as a litmus test, do you believe the 2020 election was stolen? And we can laugh at that, or we can roll our eyes, or we can get angry. We should probably do all three. But what it also means is that they are going to tap into the vein, the unfortunately very rich vein of election deniers and the election gaslighted who will hand over five, ten, fifteen dollars, maybe do it every single month because they have been convinced. because they didn't read the fine print and the uh, website sets them up to donate monthly well, whether may, they like it or not. There may be that, but also they're mm-hmm. they're all in on the big lie. So I don't know 
how well a fundraising operation that is solely dedicated to big lie adherence. I don't know how that will go because that has never really been tried. So I'm glad the Bidens have an advantage. I don't know if they can keep that advantage because the RNC is basically going to be scaring the hell out of about 100 million people and convincing them that if Joe Biden gets elected, the world will come to an end. Oh, they're already convinced of that. Yeah, but, you know, we've already seen major mega donors, the 100 million, the 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 large, like the Koch brothers, they've backed off on Trump. And if it's if election deniability and and I have friends and family who won't come straight out and say the election was stolen, but they still use phrases like I kind of have my suspicions and I'm not sure. And they say that probably to appease me. And maybe maybe when I'm not around, they'll be a little bit more like, oh, yeah, it was stolen. But still, 25 to 30 percent people still believe there was something wrong with that election. The mega donors, the 100 million, the 10 million, the 20, they're not going to come out in mass if that's their only message is, did you see how we got screwed last time? Vote for us again. You know, I think that uh, the country is getting all kind of bogged down in this, oh, the Trump voters, 67% of them believe that the election was stolen. I think part of the problem is, is that is that is such a a large umbrella. I think we should have to we have to redefine the question and ask, do you believe Donald Trump got more votes in Georgia, Arizona, and Michigan? That should be the question. And if 67% of the Americans say yes to that, well then we have an even greater stems problem than we thought we had in this country. How is one different from the other? Because if the election was stolen, lot- it means the wrong it means the wrong guy was awarded the victory. No, DJ, I can answer that. A lot of people, when they feel the election was stolen, they feel it was stolen because Democrats changed voting laws to allow more absentee ballots and mail-in ballots. They believe that there were nefarious things done with votes. I think purely asking, do you think Donald Trump got more votes is a much more specific question to ask. And I think that you'd get very different numbers if that was the question being asked. I'm not so sure, but some holster will get to that, I suppose. <laughs> Not if they're only if they're listening to me, which what are the odds of that? Well, they might be listening to you. Well, There's been some polling and apparently um, the, the Rust Belt state polls are starting to show Biden pulling even with Trump, which, yeah. which is yeah. actually a good sign because the polling has been dismal um, in the national polls. I don't read polling because it's bad for my blood pressure. So if any of you would like to comment further on that, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'm happy to hear it. Yeah, well, first of all, you're correct. Biden is doing a little bit better and pulling even to Trump in in several state polls and one or two national polls. Also, his approval rating is now up in the 40s, not in the high 40s, but it's at 40, 41, maybe even 42 percent in a couple of polls. Not a big swing, but taken together, I think it shows a trend that is optimistic. I wouldn't bet the farm on it, but it's better than you know going in the wrong direction. Yeah, I tend to agree. And I think the trends are um, what we need to start looking at as opposed to the individual data points. And the other thing to remember is Biden effectively kicked off his campaign with the State of the Union. So the the polls that happened before that were essentially pre-campaign polls where he was still, you know, hiding out in his office, not taking anybody's calls. Now he's on the trail. He's running ads. Uh, he's spending money. And that that does change things. Visibility matters. It does. And I think what we're also seeing is there was movement in the Rust Belt polling that Bloomberg had, but there's not a lot of movement in the Sun Belt polling, not a lot of movement in Georgia or Arizona. There was some movement in Nevada. And I think that's because of the nature of the campaign that of the campaign that Biden is running. It's more left wing on economic policy. There is a greater focus on the things that Biden would have agreed to on the border and that Donald Trump blew up. That's something that has strangely enough, has greater impact in places further away from the Mexican border, um, with the exception of Arizona. So I think we're seeing Biden essentially looking to use the the old blue wall to get himself reelected. And in fact, if he wins those three blue wall states and keeps every other state he won in 2020, 
he could lose Georgia, Nevada, and Arizona and still scrape across with 270 electoral votes. I don't, I'm not going to say he's going to do that per se. I think there's especially opportunity in North Carolina with some of the idiots that were nominated down ballot. But if he keeps those three, the Rust Belt three, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, if he keeps those, then he will be the favorite for re-election, not the underdog. And he, um, it's looking less and less likely that he will have a really viable third party opponent. Chris Christie has turned down no labels and Joe Lieberman died, leaving no labels without one of its major leaders. Are we going to be seeing no, no labels in the near future? Who does no labels have left? I mean, if I was sitting at the no labels headquarters, which is hard to find because they not only no labels, but no sign. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no signage, no labels, no signage, no GPS, no, no business cards. They're a very, very no, underground group. <laughs> no labels, no leaders, no locations. Right. Oh, right. There we go. Um, that's the, yeah, that's, that's a song DJ, right? That. But if I was sitting at their, at their headquarters, I would be saying, who could we get? And really, besides like Nikki Haley, who said she's sitting out and the only thing she could do, she couldn't even win the Republican primary. She's not going to win the general. She'd just be in it to spoil. Who else is out there? RFK. But I don't think No Labels wants RFK. Oh, they don't want to touch him because he's well, not actually bipartisan. He's rfk citizen. Right. Like he's, he's his own thing. Right. But besides that, there's no one at this point who can. So it's at this point just a question of lack of bodies <laughs> they've run out of. I think that they yep. should just nominate a vice presidential running mate and at the top of the ticket, just put none of the above. That did very well for Nikki Haley. So yeah. <laughs> that's okay. No labels made the same has is making the same mistake that vague centrist forces or vague centrist leaders always make in that they assume voters who are between the Republicans and the Democrats all think the same thing and will all go to the same candidate. And that's just not the case. You will have people who are who are more communitarian, who will focus more on so, the social issues pulling to the Republicans, the fiscal issues pulling to the Democrats. You folks who are more libertarian, small L, the economic issues push them to the Republicans, the social issues push them to the Democrats. Good luck finding any candidates who can pull in both of those voters at the same time. It just isn't feasible. Well, speaking of um, high-profile people who are endorsing and not endorsing, as we you mentioned at the top of the show, Biden was partying with Obama and Bill Clinton in New York this weekend. There is another living Republican former president out there uh, who is apparently locked in his painting studio, never to come out. And I, I, it's it's been fascinating to me that W has never, that I know of, said a word about Trump. Um, except to not in- invite him to his dad's funeral. And I'm curious if anyone thinks he is going to change that trend this year, particularly with no. the Cheneys coming out. Well, first no. of all, I-, I did a little Googling before, and I could be wrong. I- I- it was a very quick search, but I don't think Cheney has come out against Trump recently. He came out against Trump when Trump was bad-mouthing Liz in her re-election campaign. But since then, I don't think Dick Cheney is on record as saying, I'm not voting for Donald Trump. But going back to W. Well, hold on. Before you go there, remember, George W. Bush skipped the 2012 convention also. I mean, this isn't the first time he hasn't been part of the process. Yeah, I don't think he's going to get involved. I don't think he wants to have his image sullied. I don't think he wants to be involved in any of it. I mean, he was never on the campaign for McCain. He was never on the campaign. Well, that for- was he. He was not exactly very popular in two thousand eight or two thousand twelve. Well, right. I don't really think. I don't think McCain or Romney were rather upset that that W <laughs> kept himself. The other thing we have to remember is W still has a nephew who is in the Texas Republican Party. George P. Bush is is still out there somewhere. So there are still family pressures on him that say Liz Cheney does not necessarily have. And I think the other thing is a lot of these folks are looking at what no labels does it or doesn't do. And I think for this reason, if you look at all of the other quote unquote third party options, they're all basically from the same sort of cloth. 
very flaky, very left wing in their appearance and their presentation, very much pro Russia in their actual points of view. If no labels basically punts and says, okay, forget it, we're not having anybody, then there are a lot of people who can look and say, look, and then say, there is only one candidate out there who will defend the NATO alliance, who will defend the current international order, and who will defend our allies, and that guy is Joe Biden. If no labels actually throws up somebody, that's not necessarily an easy, that's a more difficult argument to make. Then you got to talk about possibility of winning, this, that, and the other. But if no labels doesn't do anything, they can skip all of that and just say, look, if you want to defend NATO, if you want to defend democracy, if you want to defend our allies, if you want American leadership to mean something besides a, besides being another laughing stock, and if you don't want Ukrainians to die, there's only Joe Biden. Everybody else wants Russia to win. And I think, at least I hope, I should say, that they're waiting to see if no labels actually does pass on this election. Because then, you know, we don't need to talk about viability or spoiler vote or any of that kind of stuff. These kinds of voters that are being represented by a W or the Cheneys or the Mattises or the McMasters could just look at the candidates who are running and they can say, it's Joe Biden and four morons. In fact, there's one idiot out there who changed his name. This is true. He went into court and changed his name, his legal name, to literally anybody else. And he's going to run for president and try to get on ballots using that name, literally anybody else. The joke being that people can go in and vote for literally anybody else, and they think that they're going to send some message. And what really bothers me is that Alison Camerati on CNN this morning gave this guy 10 minutes of airtime on CNN. She thinks it's it's amusing. He's wasting everybody's time. And all he's going to do is be a gimmick candidate that people can, you know, go in and laugh and vote for anybody else, literally anybody else. And all they're really doing is handing the presidency to Donald fucking Trump. Rant over. Did that sound too bitter? <laughs> Moving on along to people who are talking and not talking, we've got Ronna Romney McDaniel, former RNC chair, fired by the RNC or forced out of the RNC, uh, and then hired by NBC, but forced out of NBC by the staff of NBC. It's really not that unusual for uh, former political people like that to take jobs um, on television. Claire McCaskill comes to mind. Um Megan McCain works uh, in network Steele television. Michael Steele had the same job. Yeah, Michael Steele had the same job. Why is Rana different, do you think? Greg, what's your take on why the NBC and MSNBC staff reacted so strongly against so her? She held the position of RNC chair during a very, I hate to use the word toxic, but let's use the word toxic, presidency. And she defended it and she was part of it and she ran with it. She knew there were times that people were blatantly lying and she was like, that's how this game is played. And then when her own party had enough of her and even though she changed her own last name for them and they threw her out, she was like, well, that's OK. I'll go play for the other team. The other team didn't want her. Yeah. So you think she, you think her performance of the role of RNC chair crossed a line that maybe other political figures have not. Oh, sure. Yeah, and the other thing is, uh, you know, she also was very hostile to reporters across the board when they were questioning Donald Trump's attempt to cast doubt on the 2020 election. It wasn't just that she supported Trump's stolen election. She threw some elbows at a lot of reporters very unfairly. And, and the fact that she thought that she could resurrect her brand in one interview with Kristen Welker, where she was asked about the 2020 election, and she said, well, Joe Biden is the legitimate president. He was sworn in. But uh, I still think that there were some issues with the 2020 election. That wasn't going to do it. When uh, Chuck Todd, the only time Chuck Todd has really shown a spine, in my opinion, when he came on Meet the Press moments after the end of her interview and 
just lambasted her, lambasted NBC for what they did in a very tactful way. She was sunk right then. Since then, I've seen a lot of people blaming Joe Scarborough, blaming Rachel Maddow. I think that she was done in before those people even waited. And I applaud the NBC staff for basically creating this line in the sand because it wasn't there until they said, no, we should not be hiring anybody who had anything to do with the attempt to overturn the election, that everyone involved should be persona non grata. That was a line that the NBC staff drew. NBC said, okay, fine, we'll respect that line. If that line holds, then our democracy will be much healthier over the next nine months because we will know that a bunch of election deniers who are hoping to get on TV won't be able to get on TV. All right. So moving along to uh, things that that are actual facts, we are still having a war in Gaza. It is at a bit of a not exactly a pause, but they're not progressing with the next stages of the operation now. And the the rhetoric is heating up. We have had state department officials quitting um, over what they feel is egregious civilian casualties in Gaza. We have uh, Rep. Wahlberg of Michigan feeling that there should be more casualties in Gaza. Um, I believe he suggested that it should look like Hiroshima or Nagasaki by the time we're done with it. But as I say, the the war is treading water a little bit. Um, and we were talking about this in our group chat earlier this week. And DJ, you made the comment that Rafa would be burning were it not for the Biden administration. I'd like you to elaborate on that if you if you would, please. Sure. I think the Biden administration has made it very clear quietly and publicly that they do not want to see in Rafa a repeat of what they saw of what they have seen in the rest of Gaza. The Biden administration genuinely believes that Hamas can be rooted out of Rafa in a way that does not involve so many civilian casualties. And so far, the Israeli government is to some extent listening to them, or else they would have gone into Rafa by now. So I don't really think the administration is getting a lot of credit for that. I think there are a lot of people who'd rather the administration throw a temper tantrum or do something performative because it seems to be all that we pay attention to. But Biden is doing the difficult and the quiet and the necessary work of actually talking to other governments, actually making it clear, yes, you are our friends, but we don't want friends to self-sabotage, and we think this could be a self-sabotage if you are not careful. That is the difference between actual diplomacy and performative nonsense. If we had just had a bunch of performative nonsense, Rafa would be in ashes. Because Biden is willing to say difficult things to Israel while reminding the rest of the world that Israel is our friend and our ally and they will continue to be, they can actually get concrete things done like, hopefully, a military operation in Rafah that eliminates Hamas from that area, as it should, while minimizing civilian casualties, minimizing them far more than we've seen over the last six months. Here's my take on this, and I, I think I mentioned this in our thread between shows. I hear a lot of people who think that Biden isn't doing enough, that Biden somehow can flip a switch, and he has this power over Israel, this power over Netanyahu, that they will bend to his will. Joe Biden can't even get Greg Abbott and the state of Texas to do what he wants. The idea that he can somehow tell the state of Israel, Israel is not some little satellite nation that needs the United States for its own survival. Israel is a complete nation now. Yes, they want more of our weapons, but they are a self-determining, self-identifying nation. And the idea that any president, whether it's Joe Biden, whether it's Vladimir Putin, whether it's any leader in the world, could tell Israel what to do. Israel's going to do what it wants to do. Yes, public opinion might sway them a little bit, but you can't tell them what to do. And the idea that Biden isn't pulling the switch and saying, do this or the United States will not be your friend anymore, and therefore your country is in dire situation, it's nonsense. The only time anyone has actually been able to tell the Israelis to stop doing something 
was in 1956. It was Dwight Eisenhower, and he didn't threaten the Israelis. He threatened the British. He said, you you stop supporting the Israelis or we're going to completely devalue your currency and knock and knock your economy into recession. And even then, the Israelis were like, well, we're going to hold out. We want XYZ PDQ. And they got it to end the war of 1956. They are our allies. They are not our puppets. They are exactly. not pawns on a chessboard that we can move around wherever they are. And to the people who keep insisting that they that they are, and I don't mean the folks who are marching, I mean the idiots with PhDs who have made careers out of insisting that's how the world works. The world doesn't work that way. Shut the hell up. Here, here. While you're on a rant, let's let's keep the momentum going. What were you saying about uh, Netanyahu's government potentially um, being on on uh, shaky ground? Um, I've I've read some headlines right. about this um, pertaining to mandatory military service for the ultra orthodox, which may be maybe coming up for a vote right now. Um, how does that affect Netanyahu? So we are recording this Sunday evening. It is already Monday morning. In Israel, it is already April 1st, and April 1st was the deadline for the Israeli government to end the draft exemption for ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students, in particular to pull the subsidies that allow them to continue to be yeshiva students and therefore avoid avoid military service. This is something – this is a, like a, an 80-20 issue in Israel. 80% of the population thinks that this ultra-Orthodox exception is ridiculous, that it shouldn't it – sh- it should be ended. So you're saying that the yeshiva students get a subsidy to continue being at yeshiva so that that is like a deferment or a, or a complete exemption on the draft? Some it's n- it's yes. not yes, that some, if yeah. you are a member of a certain shul, you get exempted. It's that you are continuing right. your studies within a yeshiva. So they want to pull the subsidies for yeshiva attendance after a certain point in your education? Something okay. like that that basically says no. You, you And as a result – they would now have they would now would be available to be drafted into the Israel into the Israeli army, which is the case for every other Israeli Jew and every Israeli Arab. I mean, there are now more there there are more Arabs in the Israeli Defense Forces than there are ultra Orthodox Jews. Um, and like I said, eighty percent of the population thinks that's thinks that this is a ridiculous ex- exemption, but within the twenty percent are parties that are key parts of Netanyahu's coalition. And the question is, can BB actually hold that coalition together, or will the more secular parts of his coalition simply throw up their hands and say, no, we want no part of this anymore, we're out? In which case, you would have a shattering, and you would, and you would have elections. If BB can't find a way to get the exemption back, then the religious parties in his coalition, in particular, Shas, the one I've talked about, said, hey, throw a bunch of money at Shas again to switch sides. This is the kind of thing that would that would lead Shas to say, you know what? We're out. We're out of this coalition. And then Israel goes to elections. And uh, so moving back to domestic affairs, um, you know, we we circle back a lot to reproductive rights, reproductive justice, because we have to circle back to this because the, the right flank of our country won't stop. Um, the Supreme Court this week heard a case uh, pertaining to access to mefepristone, which is one of a two-drug cocktail that that um, will end a pregnancy if taken prior to, I can't remember if it's 14 or 16 weeks. Um, and anyways, the, the basis of the matter was that during the pandemic, um, ease of access was increased. It was the pills were available via telemedicine. You could take them at home instead of having to take them in a doctor's office. Um, and there was a coalition of anti-choice doctors and dentists who sued saying that this, A, initially saying that, that mefepristone never should have been approved in the first place 20 years ago and that the de-restricting access puts them in a position of having to deal with potential complications of a uh, mefepristone induced abortion even though it is against their principles to perform or uh, complete an incomplete abortion so the supreme court did not refuse to address the idea that it was wrongfully approved which thank goodness because if we've got ideologues able to go in and say actually i don't think the experts should have approved this two decades ago and get judges to rubber stamp that we essentially have no administrative state in this country and that would be a bad thing 
Um, and what the argument came down to was, all right, you are saying that you might be in the position that someone would come into the emergency room needing a DNC to complete a termination that had started but not completed properly from this medication cocktail, and you don't want to have to do that. How often does that happen? And the doctors stared at these women like they had grown additional heads because it doesn't happen. And then the women pointed out that some of them are dentists, and at no point in the history of ever has a woman with uterine bleeding called their dentist for assistance. And Greg seems to have strong feelings about this. He might actually be about to wet himself laughing, but oh I'm going to let him weigh in. <laughs> so, so I love. Wait, did I you call fact- a dentist for an abortion once? Is that what you're no, about to say? No, I just, I just love the fact that the two main points are the men might be bothered, like, and and the women get it. The women get the fact that the men's issue is, hey, you know what? This possibly could bother me. I'm not saying it is. It's not an issue now, but this has potential to be a real pain in my ass. These women could potentially, but so let's cut the shit out now. Two, these dentists are like, hey, women be women, and they never know which hole they're bleeding out of, whether it's their (laughs) mouth or other things. I mean, hey, women, am I right? What's the deal with women? And I love how- And the women on the court were like, what is the deal with us? Do tell. Oh, yeah. Do tell, tell me what my deal is, please. Explain sir. this more. Explain this more. And I just, I just love that. Even Amy Comey Bear was like, "Oh my gosh, what have I sold my soul for?" Was it? Yeah, well, was I mean, the- yeah, she's sitting there. She's like, "I, I've had babies, and there was never a dentist present." I'm, I'm sure Clarence Thomas was like, "Well, this all sounds very reasonable. When can I get to my motor coach? This is, uh, <laughs> this is, this is all above board." I just find uh, the whole women thing kind of oogie. So, um, yeah, this is uh, this sounds right. Yeah. Have you guys heard Beyonce's cover of Blackbird? Yeah. Do you all know the backstory of that song? What inspired Paul McCartney to write Blackbird? Uh, I had not until I read stories. something about it this morning in the WAPO. Yeah, it's a civil rights song. It was him talking about um, uh, women, young, young women who were desegregating schools. And the song Blackbird is about, you know, bird was a, was a term for a woman. And he was encouraging them. You've been only waiting, you know, take, take these, these broken wings and learn to fly. Take these eyes and learn to see. This is your moment. You've been waiting for this moment to arise. So for Beyonce to so faithfully and beautifully cover this song, you know, with the guitar and everything. It's it's like, you know, it's like she's taking a handoff from previous generations. I was just, I got chills when I heard it, you know, knowing that story about Paul McCartney. So super cool. Love that. Love Beyonce. That young lady is going places. She is going places. She's got a future. She's got a future. She's got a future. I need to hear the rest of the album too, because apparently she's, She's done some really great. So she's just very talented and very creative. All right. And I think that pretty much does it for this week. We have, we have covered all the news that's fit to cover and uh, and some that, that really isn't. I got some listener response stuff this week. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. And and it wasn't usual hate mail um, about my jokes. Um, <laughs> one of our listeners listened to DJ and I's discussion about the new Dean series. Then they had mentioned that we had forgotten to talk about the 2000 Dune miniseries. But I covered, I covered, and I told them the truth was that our actual conversation was over 10 minutes long, and it got actually pretty intense, and there was, it was a much more, and it will probably be in a future episode, minus the cursing <laughs> and the swearing. Um, but I do have to say, I can't believe I forgot that also. William Hurt was the big star and it went all the way through the first three books on sci-fi in 2000 and all the way through 2003, I think, was the second one. But but the first one was really good as far as like getting all aspects. It's only I like- remember having to shelve those books when I worked in a library in high school. And they were enormous. They were some of the longest books in the library. No. They're longer than Dickens. I'm looking this oh. up. I am going to the, the Google Wait, machine. And I'm are going, you saying that we're in a Dickens measuring contest? Is that what you're saying? Oh, for the love of 
<laughs> All right, Oliver, twist here. <laughs> 658 pages in the deluxe hardcover edition. Okay, so, deluxe hardcover. So, Rebecca, are you saying size does matter? Um. <laughs> All right. And on that note, I think we have taken this a little farther than we ever needed to. My apologies to the non sci fi people among us, including myself, who's never read or seen Dune, just shelved it. <laughs> So thank you all for listening and apologies to those who need apologies. If you enjoy what we do here, please follow us on Instagram at MPU fan club. Um, And don't forget to share our podcast link on your social media timeline. So your friends can discover us as well. As always, thanks to Alan Keeney for our theme music. And as we head into the first week of April, Greg, do you have any good pranks planned for tomorrow, April Fool's Day? I'm not allowed to do pranks anymore. My daughter one time was like, okay, it's you versus me. It started, she woke up and there was all sorts of writing on her face that said, dad is number one. (laughs) There were explosive firecrackers in her room and I set her alarm for five different times there was the saran wrap toilet oh I got yelled at that so bad by my wife who I'm lucky she's still my wife after that one 